very, very thankful for today um, because today is a day the Lord's made. And um, so as the scripture says, I'm going to rejoice and be glad in today. We are in this series uh, titled Victory, um, first of a few weeks in it. And as we are um, in it today, I am uh, looking forward to what God will do. I do hope and pray that you've been going through the, uh, the journal with us. Uh, if you have not, it's okay. You can still come and, and hopefully get something. Uh, but what the journal has been doing for me, as I said, whenever we put it together, um, it's, it's basically all of the, the background or the cross-references into where what I'm going to be preaching on, what I'm going to be speaking to. And um, today, specifically, we're in Joshua chapter 5. So if you have a, if you have a Bible, your copy of God's Word, uh, we're going to be in Joshua chapter number 5 today uh, as we begin this new series and uh, last week, the last two weeks, we did a couple of, um, uh, we, we looked at Joshua 3 and 4 uh, and talked about how the, the people of Israel crossed over the Jordan River. And when they did that, they took some stones out of the river and they set them up in Gilgal, the place they rested. And then Joshua put some stones in the riverbed uh, where the river was dried up. And so just uh, we talked about what those meant, how we can uh, look at different transitions in our lives, different places in our lives, and see that, uh, that God is at work and he is doing something incredible and amazing. And so now we find the children of Israel, they have been in the wilderness. If you remember, the, uh, just kind of give you the little background here, they've come out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery where they were enslaved. Uh, by the people of Egypt. They've come out. They, if you remember, Moses led them out, right? The, the great Red Sea parting. And when they went out of the Red Sea, they went through the Red Sea. Uh, and then we see that um, when they did that, Pharaoh and his army chased them. They were like, oh no, we shouldn't have let them go. They chased them. God then throws them into the midst of the sea. The water crushes Pharaoh and the army of the Egyptians. And they die in that terrible, tragic scene, but of God's wrath being poured out against people that are not for God. So then the children of Israel go into the wilderness. They go into the wilderness and they are there for 40 years. And the reason they're in the wilderness for 40 years is because when they went into the wilderness... Shortly after, God said, I want you to go into the promised land. And so he sent 12 men into the promised land to spy it out. Remember that part of the story? They go in there and then they come back and they say, we shouldn't go attack these guys. They're big. They're going to take us out. And so then they, they took a vote. They voted not to go into the, the land God had promised them. And then they were sent to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because of disbelief. Because of unbelief, they said, we, we, we can't do this, and so we're not going. And th the whole time, the scripture, uh, there, there's a lot of po uh, pictures pointing to the fact that, like, it's not supposed to be them fighting the battle. God's fighting the battle for them. Yet, they have no belief, they have no faith that God is going to take care of them in this new land, so they wander in the wilderness. Now, that generation dies off. The generation of unbelievers, the generation that had no faith, die off. There's two guys left from that generation. You know those two guys, Joshua and Caleb. And we're going to see in this book, in this account over this series, we're going to see these two guys just seeing victory after victory after victory. And I think there's something to be said about a man, a man of faith who is willing to say, I believe God can do what he says he can do. And I'm going to put my faith and trust in him and watch him deliver us. So here we are now. Joshua uh, and, and Caleb is in this crowd and these guys go, uh, they walk through the, the Jordan River on dry ground and they get to the other side, set up their stones and then listen to what happens in chapter number five, beginning at verse number one. The Bible says this, as soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over. Their hearts melted and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. So here's where we are. God does an incredible miracle. The testimony of that miracle travels all throughout Canaan. And the kings, the leaders in Canaan say, we're afraid because that God's on the move and he's taken out anybody in their way. So we know that God has, has this, the God of the Israelites is the real deal. 
So now they are afraid. They are fearful. They have no spirit left in them. It says their hearts melted with fear. So now they have no drive. They know if Israel shows up, they're going to lose. That's what they know. That's what the evil kings know. So here's what I, here's what I think. If I'm, if I'm writing this story, here's what I do. I say, now that fear has struck all these kings, this is the time to attack, right? This is the moment. This is when we got to go in and just take it. You, listen, we're going to use momentum to our ability, to our favor. We're going to use uh, fear to our favor. We're going to use all these, all these things to our favor so we can go in and, and defeat them easier. And God says, wait. In fact, do you know this, this, this timeline from Joshua 3 to Joshua 5 and even the next chapter, it's, about, it's over two weeks of a span. So it says they came up out of the Jordan River in Joshua chapter 4 on the 10th day of the month, right? 10th day of the first month. And so they come out then and they they go through. God takes them this long process over two weeks before they would see the first victory in Jericho. Over two weeks. Why? Why wait? Fear is in the heart of the enemy. Now's the time to attack. Now's the time we can capture victory, right? But here's what I've learned about the principles of God. Before God can trust you with victory, he's got to prepare you for victory. See, here's here's what we all think. Well, now's the time the enemy's in trouble. Let's go attack. The enemy's weak right now. And God said, it doesn't matter how strong the enemy is, I'm stronger. No matter what time you attack the enemy, I am stronger. I am more powerful. I can take the enemy and just make him quit breathing. It doesn't matter how powerful or strong he is, you've got me. Here's what we do in our life. We're measuring up the enemy the whole time. And the whole time God's saying, I don't need you to be looking at the enemy. I need you to be looking at me. I need you to prepare your heart. I need you to prepare your soul. I need you to prepare your mind. I need you to prepare everything about who you are and see that I'm on your side and I'm the one that is going to win. I don't care how big the enemy is. I don't care how afraid he is. I don't care how confident he is. I'll take him down when I want to take him down. I want to prepare your heart so that you can see something happen. See, God is showing us already in chapter 5, verse number 1, the enemy is afraid, but you're not ready. The enemy is, is listen, the enemy knows it's over. They, they're not going to win against this God that's going to shut the Jordan up that is overflowing in its banks right now in the season of harvest. But what I believe has happened is something incredible that we have missed when we read the story. But listen, I want to read now verses uh, 2 through 9. So the first thing we see is that the enemy is afraid, but it's not about how afraid the enemy is before we pursue our victory, can't, God cannot trust us with victory until he prepares us for victory. Listen to what it says in verses 2 through 9. At that time, the time, remember, at that time, the time the enemy was afraid. Here it is. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gebethahara. And they, this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. The people, for the people of Israel, walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. There was disbelief. The Lord swore to them that they would not, that he would not let them see the land the Lord God had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was their children whom he raised up in, the, in, the, in their place that Joshua circumcised. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. When the circumcising of the whole nation had finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the the reproach of Egypt from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. So here's what this is. So I'm going to just kind of give you this little summary here. So um, God says, okay, the enemy is afraid. You're now in enemy territory. You're just a couple miles out of Jericho. So the enemy's afraid. Uh, They they know that God's strong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to perform surgery on every male that could possibly fight. 
<laughs> that, that day. There he is. He's like, we're going to perform surgery on him. We're going we're to do this surgery. And I, I can imagine Joshua saying, what if the enemy knows we're, having, we're, all, we're all under surgery? What if the enemy knows we're all weak? What if the enemy knows we're then in, 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 or in, immobile? We can't, be, we can't be fighting after we just come through this surgery. We need some season to heal. And God says, I protect you. I'm the one in charge. I'll even let the enemy know all your men are going, undergoing surgery. If you want me to, I'll let them know that. And I could just I'm imagining this is not in scripture. I just picture Joshua being like, no, we won't tell the enemy we're all going under surgery right now. Um, and so these, these men were having to be circumcised. Now, we, we ask the question, why this? Right? Why this? Um, this week we read a little bit through uh, the, the, the circumcision, the covenant of circumcision. So I just want to take you back to that and give you the explanation of why this is important to us. So if you remember back in Genesis, whenever God talked to a man named Abram, Abram, he told Abram, you're going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those that are coming from your lineage, from your legacy. And um, so uh, Abraham, Abram was uh, talked to his wife. And he said, hey, uh, we're supposed to have a baby, and, but Sarah couldn't have a wife. And so or couldn't have a, uh, she couldn't have kids. So his wife couldn't have kids. So she says, you know, since I can't have kids, maybe go into my servant and, and have kids with her, which is, a, which is a non-faith decision. It's a flesh decision, right? We, since, since this can't happen in our flesh, then go and, and, and let it happen in someone else's flesh. That's a, that's a, see, God says, I'm going to bless you and your wife with kids. We're, we're gonna, I'm going I'm I'm to give you a, a generation that's going to come after you. And Abraham, Abram at that point, could have said, let's just believe God can do it. Instead, he listens to flesh. And he says, I'm going to go and lay with my, my wife's servant and uh, have a baby with her. He has a baby with her. That baby is named Ishmael. Ishmael is a, um, a baby born of the flesh. And so he is, he's 13 years old by the time God visits Abram again. God visits Abram and says to him, Abram, your name is now Abraham. And I'm telling you, you're going to have a son with your wife, Sarah. Her name's going from Sarai to Sarah. And you're going to have a son with her. Abraham laughs. There's no way that can happen. I'm old, she's old, it ain't, <laughs> we're way past those days. Lord, this is not, this is not, are you kidding me? And God says, I want to, I, I'm telling you, I'm making a covenant with you. I'm gonna create a generation through your son. His, your son's gonna be named Isaac. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fulfill this in you. So God says, I'm writing the covenant out. You gotta sign it. So how does he tell Abraham to sign it? He says, I want you to circumcise yourself. Now, in, in this circumcision is a cutting off of the flesh. So here's what God says when he begins this covenant process. He says, I want you to act in faith, not in flesh. So I need you to cut the flesh off so that you are going to now come into a covenant agreement with me that you're not gonna respond and act in flesh. Because when God calls you to do something, God-sized, you can't do it in the flesh. You've gotta do it by faith. So he says, Abraham, I want you to cut off the flesh so that you are making a covenant with me that you're no longer going to respond in the flesh. You're no longer going to act in the flesh. You're going to start acting by faith. So then what happens? We fast forward. So now we, we first see the, uh, the, 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 the son Ishmael is born of flesh. The son Isaac is born in a faith thing. He's born in faith that God is going to do something. So that's when the covenant started. And when did he tell, when did he tell Abraham, I want you to circumcise your sons on what day? The eighth day. Why does that matter? Because, oh, it matters. Let me tell you why it matters. Because the eighth day represents the day of resurrection. A full week goes on. Let's say you start on, on uh, Sunday, right? Sunday's the first day of the week. Then you got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It goes all the way to Saturday. That's the seventh day. And then the eighth day, is the first day of the week. 
You know what happened on the first day of the week? Flesh was destroyed forever. Let me tell you what happened on the first day of the week. See, this man named Jesus shows up. He dies on a cross during the Passover season, which we're going to get to in just a second. Oh, it's so good. He dies, and he dies on that, on that weekend, and he raises on the first day of the week for the first time. Now, we put our faith in him. It's a faith. I'm, I put all my faith in the resurrection of Jesus because if he didn't resurrect from the dead, I'm not going to resurrect from the dead. If he didn't go and, and defeat death, and hell and the grave and all that, then I can't defeat death, hell, and the grave. I have to put my faith in him. It's not a flesh thing, it's a faith thing. So on the eighth day, God is even pointing us to the very truth that resurrection is coming and you're not gonna get there by flesh. You're gonna get there by faith. And so that's the the, the covenant that was between God and his people. And when they were in the wilderness, that generation of unbelievers, that generation that did not trust the power of God, did not trust, and they walked through the Red Sea, they saw saw the pillar of fire by night, a cloud by day. They saw the presence of God. They put a tabernacle up. Everything pointed to the very presence of God. And yet they would not, they wouldn't believe in him. They wouldn't trust in him. They wouldn't have enough faith that God could produce what God could produce. And yet God is saying, I'm going to now, you, you, you've gone past and you've ne- neglected the covenant You've neglected what I told you about. You've been acting in the flesh this whole time, and I'm telling you it's time to act in faith. So God brings the children of Israel right here to this place and tells Joshua, you got to deal with the flesh before you can get to victory. Let me tell you a a truth for all of us. we got to deal with our flesh before we're going to get to victory. What is the flesh you have in your life? What is that flesh? It's whatever doesn't align with your faith. It's whatever doesn't align with the power of God himself. It's whatever you say, I can do this this way. If you can do it, then why would God do it? Why would God let you experience something supernatural if you could have done it your way the whole time? He's not gonna do it. You gotta deal with your flesh. Your flesh may be something that, that re- reminds you or pulls you into a direction that is against God's will. Maybe it's some addiction in your life. Maybe it's some temptation in your life that you just cannot seem to go past. Maybe it's some, whatever your flesh is, you gotta deal with that before you'll experience victory. I've heard tons of people tell me over and over and over again, I just don't see victory in my life. I just don't see it. People live in this life, they're all happy. People live in this life, they're all, support, they're all excited and they, they can't wait to see what God's gonna do next. I don't see that kind of victory. The first step is you gotta deal with your flesh first. You gotta deal with those things that are holding you back, those things that you are saying, I get it, God told me to do this, so I'm gonna do it my way. And God's like, no, 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 no. Abraham, I didn't want you to do it your way. I wanted you to have faith and do it my way. That's what I wanted. My ways are higher than your ways. I'm going to take the entire children of Israel, put them in the enemy's territory, and then I'm going to have, make, make, put all the men of war under surgery. <laughs> That's not, what? That doesn't make any sense. And God says, it makes total sense. You better deal with your flesh before I'll let you see victory. You got to deal with that first, the sin in your own heart, in your own life. Those parents in the wilderness uh, should, be, uh, should be beat up, in my opinion, because they were the ones that did not circumcise their children on the eighth day. They are the ones that said, because what happens is we get complacent. They were fine in the wilderness. They were fine. After they complained a few times, don't, I mean, don't get me wrong, they were like, hey, we had plenty of food in Egypt. Where's our food? And God's like, I'll tell you what, here's some manna. What is this stuff? You know what manna means? Manna, the word manna literally means what is this? That's what manna is. What, what is this stuff? I don't even know. What are we going to call it? We'll call it, what is it? That's what we'll call it. Hey, did you gather your what is it today? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's what manna literally, the literal translation is what is it? It's a flaky-like substance. You know, it's funny how they all tried to explain it in the, in the scripture. It's like, it's this flaky stuff, but kind of like dew and frost and like kind of biscuity. I don't know. It's like, eat this in the morning. What is it? I don't know. It's, uh, you know, so what is it? Well, that's what it is. What is it? Yeah. You know, it's almost like a, like a comedy sketch, right? It's like, what'd you have for breakfast? What is it? Well, I know that's what I'm asking. No, that's, I had, what is it? That's what I have. That's, that's the, the, the word manna. But God provided that for them. He, he showed up to them and that generation was just fine where they were. And they got complacent. And when they got complacent, they forgot the covenant. Then what happens? So God says, first, you've got to deal with your flesh. Then he says, verses 10 and 11, listen to this. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. 
And the day after Passover, on, uh, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. Now, before I go to verse 12, let's picture this. Why did they, did, there is no record in the wilderness after um, uh, Sinai, there's no record as they were wandering in the wilderness that they, that they uh, uh, held the, the feast of Passover. No record of it. Now, did they? Maybe, but there's no record of it. And I think there's probably no record of it because you had to be, if you're a male, you had to be circumcised in order to take part in the Passover legally. And so they weren't, they weren't obeying the Lord with that first command, with the, first, with the covenant of, of I'm going to not live by flesh, I'm going to live by faith. So they didn't, they didn't follow the Lord in that command. So they didn't follow the Lord in most of the commands. So the, the command for Passover, have Passover. So they didn't have Passover while in the wilderness. I want to show you a couple things in these two verses that I think we may miss if we're not careful. This uh, scripture says that they had uh, um, Passover. They, they kept this, uh, kept this uh, uh, um, uh, feast of Passover, but it says where? It says where? Did you see that? Listen, it says they kept the Passover on the 14th day uh, in the evening on the plains of Jericho, on the plains of Jericho. I think that one's interesting. I think it's interesting where they were. Why did it mention where they were? Jericho, if you remember, is the enemy. That, that, it's the enemies right there. That's, that's where they were. So they were in the plains of the enemy. That's, that's okay. Where are you going with this, Pastor? Well, I have to know the next verse. Because the next verse says this. It says, And the day after Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. So there was a, a meal there provided. Can I tell you in Psalm 23, verse number five, it says that our good shepherd provides for us. It says that he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Let me tell you something. It, you, you in the, you're in the presence of your enemies and God's like, here's you a spread to eat. Don't be worried about your enemies. I'm protecting you. Don't you worry about those that are looking in on you thinking, how can we destroy them? Don't you worry about them I'm taking care of them. You just sit and eat right here. Let's let them even look in. How do I know that? They, listen, the, the, the produce of the land was, was full. Why? How do I know that? Because the last chapter said the, the banks of the Jordan were overflowing. When did the banks of the Jordan overflow? In a time of harvest. There's food in plenty, in supply, more than they've ever had. is right there in front of them in the presence of their enemies. God says, I will prepare a table before you. So many times we're focused so much on the enemy, we're missing the meal in front of us. So many times, and why is it? Because we've not dealt with our flesh first. After you deal with your flesh and you say, these are the things in my life that cause me not to put my faith in Jesus. These are the things in my life that cause me not to follow after Christ with all my heart. These are the things, cut them out. Cut them out of your life. Once you get that, in the book of Romans, it tells us that circumcision is the circumcision of the heart. Now, as a believer today, it's not the, the physical custom we have to follow. It's now circumcision of the heart. We're cutting out those things in the flesh that keep us from faith. That's what we're cutting out in our lives. So as we do that, we have to understand, it, it, we gotta, gotta deal with the flesh first. After you deal with the flesh, then you have to come to the place where you are now uh, uh, looking to the substitute. You're now looking to who Jesus is. Passover, if you remember, points to the blood of the lamb. Passover points to the very substitute that kept the wrath of God from coming into your life. Passover was happening, happened in Egypt. Remember, it's, you had to take the, the lamb and you had to slay the lamb. You had to kill it and rub its blood all over your doorpost and your thresholds all over your door. And you had to be found in that house, in the blood of the lamb, so that you didn't experience the wrath of God. That lamb, the blood of the lamb itself is what kept the wrath of God from taking your family. It's what kept the wrath of God from killing, from death in your life. And so if, if that's what it took, as they take Passover now, they're remembering, I have to fall in the blood of the lamb. I have to be found in the blood of the lamb. So they had Passover. So the first thing they did is they dealt with the flesh. Then they pointed their faith. See, we, we can't just put our faith in anything. We can't just put our faith in, in, in the, the, the governing powers. We can't just put our faith in, in the, 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 the intellect that we have. We can't just put our faith in anything. So God says, I want you to deal with your flesh first. Cut out anything that takes away your faith. And then I want you to point and direct your faith to me, to him. 
It's to the person of Jesus Christ is where all of my faith is. Every bit of it, all of it. I, I believe in Jesus. I believe he came. I believe he died. I believe he rose again. And I believe, because I believe that, I know I will live forever with him. I'm living with him right now. God is in my life right now. I am a son of God because God has adopted me into his family through the blood of Jesus. I don't experience his wrath because I've put my faith in the blood of the lamb. And so now they have Passover here in the land of Canaan. In the, in the very presence of their enemies, God has prepared a table because the plains are full of produce. This is what it says in verse number 12. And the manna ceased in the day after they ate the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. You know, um, a couple of things about the fruit of the land of Canaan. You know, whenever God uh, refers to the promised land, here's something interesting if you're, if you're a science nerd. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's something cool about the promised land. It keeps talking about the land flowing with milk and honey, Right? That's what it says. What it, when it talks about that land, it talks about the land flowing with milk and honey. Anytime God references Canaan, he talks about the land flowing with milk and honey. Did you know that of all the, the uh, nutritional substances on earth, milk and honey are the only two that don't require brokenness or death? Here, here's what I mean by that. You may say, well, fruit, fruit grows, seed has to die. Well, but what about animal? Well, they have to die, yeah. You don't eat a live animal, right? Uh, you, milk and honey are the only two substances that do not require brokenness or death. It's produced by life. God is going to bring you into an abundance and it's a land full of life. Even the produce of the land will be life. They, they, and they talk about any time, and here's the thing that, that blows my mind. Any time that the, the Israelites talk about the land, they talk about the fruit. They talk about, listen, all this great, look what all we can get. And God's saying, don't miss the fact that there's life in the land that I'm going to give you. There is so much life. I want to let you live on the, the, the very production with life itself in mind. God is a God of life. He wants living creatures. He wants living things. He wants people to live. That's what he wants. And as he's doing that, he's even saying, the land I'm preparing for you is flowing with milk and honey. He doesn't say it's flowing with grapes the size of your fist. That's not what he says. He says it's flowing with life-giving nutrients that's sustained and built by life itself. There's, you're going to see life all around this. When he says that the manna ceased this day and they lived off the fruit of the land, God said this, I am no longer having to provide this miracle for you. Now I'm going to show you that the place I've given you already has all the provisions that you need, everything. So you're going to live off of this now. So the first thing we have to do is deal with the flesh. The second thing we have to do is point our faith. And then verses 13 through 15, Joshua chapter 5. The Bible says this, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in hand. And Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet. The place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. You know, this week, every day I read this chapter, I got to this place and I, I got tears filled my eyes every time, every time. And, and there's a couple reasons. One, there, there's no account, there's no record that anybody else other than Joshua experienced this. There was nobody else mentioned. He was off by himself. And sometimes leadership feels lonely. Sometimes you feel like you're alone. Sometimes you feel like you have to do things that are bigger than life and, and you can't do it by yourself. And I'm not talking about just leading a, a giant army. I'm not talking about leading a, a company. I'm not talking about leading a church. I'm not talking about, I, I'm, I'm talking about being a dad. I mean, leading my family. You know, it just feels like it's lonely. 
I'm like, you, you, you kids don't understand any of this stuff going on. I'm, I'm having to deal with things that are so hard and so difficult. And, you know, my wife's like, hey, let me help you with something. I'm like, I, I, I'll let me carry this burden for just a little bit longer by myself before I put any of it on you. I, w- I want to lead my family well. I want to be that person that, that God is proud of at the end of the day that says, thank you for doing what I've called you to do. I'm proud of you. Well done. That's what I'm looking for. But sometimes that road gets lonely. And, and I just picture Joshua being alone taking one of his walks. And here's what happens in the scripture. Every single time, do you know every time in scripture, this isn't even my notes, this is a free one. Every single time in my my, my understanding in scripture that someone lifted their eyes, their situation changed. Every single time you will ever see in scripture someone lifting their eyes, their situation changed. Now, the, the circumstances didn't change, but something changed in them. Something changed in them. It says in this scripture, let me read it again so that you don't miss it. It says, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted his eyes and looked. You know what that means to me? Joshua was walking around with his head down for a minute, right? You ever been been stressed out? You ever been nervous? You ever been worried? And you, you pace? You pace, people pace with their head down most of the time. They pay, he's pacing. He's thinking, oh man, we just underwent a lot of surgery, <laughs> a lot of surgery. That was awkward and weird, and it was, but it happened. Here we are. It says, we just went under a lot of surgery. We got a whole city. We got our enemy right outside us. <sighs> Man, that's tough, but we ate that fruit. That fruit was good. Man, that, that, this, the, the grain was just, just rich. This past couple of days have been amazing. Man, it's just been awesome. And then he lifts his eyes. And bam, right there in front of him is a man drawn with a sword that is pretty intimidating according to the text. (laughs) Immediately, Joshua goes to him and says, are you for us or for our enemies? You know what he's saying? I'm I'm gonna measure this out right here because whatever this guy says, we're either either in good place or bad place. Like this is either good or bad. Are you for us or for our adversaries? Are you for us or for the enemy? Because Josh was thinking, I'm in enemy territory. I know my people. I don't know this guy. I've never seen this guy. I've never seen what he is. Now, this is one of the pre-incarnations of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. You will see moments. I'd love to get into the Christology of that and explain more about the Old Testament uh, images of Jesus that Jesus shows up. We see him a couple of places in Abra- with Abraham. We see him showing up as a, as a, a, a traveler and he, he shares a meal with Abraham. We see him with Jacob. Uh, and whenever you remember uh, with Jacob, he wrestles Jacob uh, when it, and puts him in submission. We see uh, whenever the, the, the three guys, the Hebrew guys in the fiery furnace, right? You know that story from Bible school. Uh, and Jesus was in the furnace with him, the, the person of Jesus. This is one of those moments where we see the person of Jesus right here, sword drawn. Now the other, the other situations, we see him sharing a meal. We see him wrestling a guy. We see him uh, walking around in a fire. He's got his sword drawn in this place. Joshua asked the question, are you for us or for them? And Jesus says to him, no, wrong question. <laughs> I'm not here to take a side. I'm here to take over. I'm, I'm here, I'm here uh, as the commander of the Lord's army. I'm here with an army so strong, the enemy doesn't stand a chance. There is no way. Listen, Joshua, I'm not not here to give you, to tell you which side I'm on. I'm I'm here to ask you what side you're on. I'm here to ask you, are you going to follow in faith? You have dealt with the flesh. You have now pointed your faith to the very person, the very sacrifice, the substitute of the one that will take your place to take the wrath of God for you. And now I'm asking you, what side are you on? Who are you going to choose to follow today? Where is your faith today? Is it in the walls of Jericho? Is it in the people that are around you? Or is it in me? So many times we will look at the enemy and then we'll look at us and we'll say, how many resources do we have? Only, you only need one resource. It's all you need. I promise you, I've looked through scripture. David had one stone. He took all five with him, but he only needed one because that one was thrown in faith. And that faith stone was the one that slayed Goliath. You only needed one lamb to take care of the sacrifice for you and your family. You needed one. You only need one. And that one resource is this person standing here before you with his sword drawn. And as soon as this happens, Joshua falls to his face, his face to the earth, and he worships him and says, what do you want me to do? 
I'm yours. Listen, we, we wonder and wonder and wonder. Why do we not see victory in our life? Well, we never dealt with our flesh. Those things that are keeping us from faith, we just don't deal with it. We don't. We come in here on Sunday and we're like, I'm like, hey, how are you doing today? Oh, pastor, I'm doing great, doing great. Been a great week. Been a hard week, but it's been a great week. It hasn't been a great week. Don't lie to me. Coming in here lying. It's like, it's been a hard week. I get that. It's okay. It's okay to have a hard week. It's okay. It's whenever you stumble and fall, you just got to be able to confess it to one another and share it with one another so that you can get the flesh cut out of your life. See, we fall in our flesh, but we rise in our faith. That's how this process works. And as, as I look at the scripture over and over and over again, I can't help but think we want to see victory so bad, but we don't want to prepare for victory. And God is telling us in order for you to be trusted with victory, if God can't trust you with victory, he's not going to give you victory. He says, I want to trust you with victory. So before we get there, I got to prepare you to experience and, and, and know the victory is from the Lord, not from you. He just, and, and it, this, this is, the, the people of Israel saw miracle after miracle after miracle. Think about this for a second. They saw, they saw bread from heaven, biscuits. This week, I had my wife make flaky layers biscuits for me. I did. We, we, I ate it every morning. I ate it this morning. Flaky biscuits. It was awesome. Why did I eat it? Because I felt like it was manna. It was, just, it was so good. Throw some butter on those things. And just flaky biscuits. Just, just, you know, it's just the kind of crispy on the edges. You know what I'm talking about? Just this big, uh, just uh, so just heavenly, right? It's, it's, what is this stuff? It's manna. It's what it is. And I, we, I've been eating these flaky biscuits today. As I ate these flaky biscuits this morning, I, I just began to think, man, God provided this without having to turn an oven on, without having to, to crack open one of those cans that explode and freak everybody in the house out. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? It's always fun to watch my wife do that. You know, it's like, she's that person, right? She's going to bust the thing open. And it's like, poof, it's, ah! it freaks out every time. It's awesome. I watch it happen. I'm like, this is, this is but worth more entertainment than anything else in the world. Like it is so good to watch. And as I, as we ate these, these, I think, man, God provided this for them and just, it showed up. And then when did it stop showing up? The minute he provided something else. And he, he just keeps on and keeps on. He just stopped the waters of the Jordan. He just said, I want, to, I want you to set up a testimony for me that will be a testimony these stones will say and point back to what God has done in his power and his might and his provision and everything he's got. And now he shows up and says, in order for me to trust you with victory, I need you to take care of your flesh. I need you to point your faith directly at the substitute that took your place. And now we see Jesus. You realize the way this, this has gone, right? The enemy's afraid already. God says, no, no, I don't, I don't want you to think the enemy's afraid so you, get, so you got a better chance. I want you to know you got me. You, you don't need any chances. You got me. So I just need you, but I need you to prepare and look at me. I need you to see me. I need you to hear me. After the flesh is dealt with, after our faith is pointed, we see Jesus here and we see his power. And what does he tell Joshua? Take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. Holy ground. Holy ground. In the presence of his enemies? This is where the heathen live. And Jesus says to him, it doesn't matter where the heathen live, I'm here. If I'm here, it's holy. You want more holiness in your life? You want to see more holy moments? Do you want to see more uh, uh, God-sized things? Stop doing it in the flesh. Stop trying to, to live out this calling in your own power. You can't do it. You can't. Go back and look at the story of Abraham whenever he tried to do it that way. And there was turmoil with this kid. There was turmoil with his wife, with, his, with the, the, the uh, servant of his wife. There was turmoil in his family. It was trouble. Why? Because he acted in the flesh. That's why there was turmoil. He didn't act in faith. So God says, your covenant with me is you're going to prove to me. I, I want you to this, cut the flesh off of you. Cut it off. Get it out. You don't need it in your life. If you, if you act in the flesh, you're going you're to reap the rewards of all the flesh can bring. If you act in faith, you're going to see victory after victory after victory. This place in Scripture in Joshua 5, what we find is you deal with the flesh first. Then you deal with pointing your faith in the right direction. Then and only then will you see the power of God displayed in your life. It's, that's, that's when it happens. So what in your life needs to be cut out? That's the first question. Maybe you've not dealt with the flesh yet. Maybe you've got things in your life that need to be cut out of your life. Maybe it's a waste of your time. 
Maybe it's a waste of your talents. Maybe you've got something that's sucking the time right out of your life. And you're doing it because you enjoy it in the flesh. It doesn't, it doesn't reap any faith benefit. It doesn't reap any reward spiritually. It doesn't put you in the presence of God. Think about this. Whenever you do something, does it put you in the presence of God or does it take you out of the presence of God? If it takes you out of the presence of God, that's a flesh thing. Stop it. If it puts you in the presence of God, that's a faith thing. Keep going. It's that simple. This is not hard. This is not, this is not anything difficult to understand. It's simple. It may not be easy all the time, but it's simple. Do things that follow faith rather than flesh. So what does it need to be cut out of your life? What is it you need to do that you need to stop uh, uh, taking away from your faith journey and experience? Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's uh, your talent. Maybe you've got some talent and skill and ability to serve the church in a way that is unique and you're not doing it. That is, that's acting in the flesh, thinking I, I'm going to do this my own way, not God's way. Maybe it is your treasure, your, the things that you, you uh, your resources, what you have. Maybe you need to give it to God and not try to keep it for yourself. Maybe you need to give God something instead of taking it for yourself, it, whether it be anything, it, whatever it is in your life. Maybe you need to deal with your flesh. Maybe you need to point your faith. Maybe you say, I've dealt with my flesh. I'm following the Lord in my faith walk. I think we all can deal with the flesh regularly. <laughs> the book of Romans says it's circumcision of the heart. You can circumcise the heart multiple times. You circumcise the flesh once. <laughs> and so you, you, it's a constant, constant walk with the Lord. Constant cutting out of those things of the flesh. Maybe it's pointing your faith. Maybe you need to point your faith, to your family, to Jesus more. Maybe you need to, at your table, have a little extra time in prayer. Maybe you need to have that extra conversation in the car with the kid or the spouse or the whatever about your faith journey, about what God is doing in your life. Maybe that's pointing your faith, right? It's to, because what does the Passover do? It tells of the works of God. That's what the Passover did. Everything in the Passover meal, I was going to have it all set out here and show you all the pieces of the Passover meal, but we just run out of time. So look it up on your own. It's great. The pieces of the Passover meal were all pointing to the, the, the very person and the work of Jesus, the work of God that he did and he showed us the way. It's what Passover was about. How can you show and share the works of God more in your life? How can you do that? What can you do? What can you say? How can you say it? Maybe you need to point your faith. Maybe, just maybe, you're in the place in your life where you come in here and you experience the presence of God and you're just, you're just moved. You just move. Maybe you're, you're, maybe you're like me. Whenever you get to this place in the scripture and you read about whenever Joshua sees Jesus sword drawn and says, who, who are you? And he says, I'm, I'm in charge. And then just fall in worship. Maybe, maybe your, your tears begin to flow. Then here, here's what my suggestion is. If you've, if you've already dealt with your flesh, if you've already pointed your faith, then my, my encouragement is then just submit to him. Fall, fall in worship to him. Just worship him. He's, he's here. He's right there. He shows up. Most of us aren't looking up. Most of us are looking down. Most of us have a device in our hand and our head is down. Most of us walk around and, and pace and we, we worry and we stress. There, there is a, there's two visual systems in your brain. You don't know this, but uh, there's two visual systems in your brain. One is above the horizon, one is below the horizon. There's chemicals, different chemicals that fire within your brain. Whenever your, your eyesight is below the horizon, anytime it's pointed down, anytime you're looking down, there, the chemicals that fire in your brain produce stress, produce anxiety, produce worry, produce uh, uh, negativity, produce depression. Anytime your eyes are up, there's a chemical that fires in your brain. It's a crazy phenomenon. I'm like, this is amazing. God wired us this way. And then he tells us in the scripture to lift our eyes. Whenever our eyes are above the horizon, we find peace. We find love. We find joy. We find those things we appreciate. We find all that. So why in the world are we walking around? We're a generation with our head down. And the whole time we look at the scripture, when Joshua raises his eyes in the presence of his enemy, he raises his eyes and he doesn't see the enemy anymore. He sees Jesus. It doesn't say what's in the background. It doesn't say what he's standing with. It doesn't say any of this. It says he saw the one standing that has come to take over. It's time we lift our eyes. It's time we start looking up and seeing where he is. If you have dealt with your flesh, if you've pointed your faith to him and you look up, I promise you this, you'll see him everywhere. You'll see him everywhere. When you see him everywhere, your life then begins to go and march in victory. After Joshua 
bowed before this great King of kings and Lord of lords with all the victory summed up right there as he's holding his sword drawn in his hand. When Joshua bows his head and bows his, his very posture to the ground, he see, after he's seen this one and said, what do you want me to do? The next chapter begins victory after victory after victory after victory. You want to see victory in your life? You got to see Jesus first. You have to. You're not going to go out and see some victory without him. You may see a small little thing that you think is a win, and the whole time God is saying, oh, no, 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 I didn't trust you with victory because you didn't trust me first. Deal with your flesh, point your faith, and then lift your eyes to see the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's pray. Joining us online today, we hope you enjoyed the worship experience. If you want to get connected to our church family, the easiest way to do that is to text the word welcome to the number on the screen. That will put you into our text messaging service, which you will be able to get information about our church family and ways you can connect. If at any point during the message today, you felt a stirring or a prompting that you had questions and want to know more information, you can also, after you are a part of our text messaging service, you can just text that number and ask anything and it will come to our pastors. We can pray with you if you have a prayer request or whatever you may need. We invite you to come and join us in person. We would love to meet you face to face and see how we can serve your family within this community.